Good morning, Collier. Well, good morning, Michael. Good to see you, man. Great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Collier Smith is uh, soon to be governor of District 6380 in the Rotary world, not next year, but the year after that. And the reason why we thought this recording might be useful to all incoming governors, whether they're district governor elects, district governor nominees, doesn't matter, district no governor nominee designates, all incoming governors face the same basic challenges. We're talking about things like membership, giving, uh, participation, leadership succession, and certainly these are on your mind as you get ready to take the helm in 6380, I'll call you. Absolutely. So I appreciate you uh, participating in a recorded call because I do think I, if we have any, if we can shine any light and provide clarity to, uh, for people in this call, it, it would have been worth our time to just press the record button. And uh, for those of you watching and listening, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about a, a particular district because I want to serve Collier today as well. And so we'll, uh, since both of us are from 6380, I was governor in 2016-17. Collier is going to be governor in what year? 2022-2023. Okay. No, it's 2023 and 2024. <laughs> it's, it's hard sometimes to figure this out. Um, right. And this is part of the problem too, because... Um, uh, not, not only you have to think about 2324, but you have to get other people thinking about 2324, which is a challenge because they haven't started thinking about 2223 yet. Right. This is the challenge. And, and Rotarians are conditioned that every year that leader is going to change. So uh, how, how comfortable do they get with the current person when they just know that then no one's going to spin in any time? This is the challenge of changing the leadership every year which on, on the surface is not a bad idea, but it has its, has its challenges. You were kind to ask about what happened in 1617. Um, we initiated a theme that year um, that, um, and people have issues with themes. There are people that have issues with the uh, Rotary International theme, which is kind of thrust upon all of the 535 districts, which is this, and, and clubs, which is the international theme of the year. And then if the district has a theme, it can be confusing because then people, I mean, hell, they get confused about the annual theme. You see people showing the annual theme years after it, it occurred. Uh, but we knew we had the marketing bandwidth to promote a secondary theme, a district theme in 1617. And the theme was go public with Rotary, which I thought not only was a good theme, it was a good creed for any uh, district that was looking to you know, branch out and get out into the public and stop being so insular uh, with, with, with activities and stuff like that. What do you remember about Go Public with Rotary in 1617? Sure, well, I should share that while you were district governor, I was president of the Rotary Club of Ann Arbor and A we were having our centennial. That's so right. that tied in and so I was very in tune to the district. Um, and one of the things and the challenges that I saw, particularly in clubs in the district, but particularly uh, with ours when I focused on that is the fact that how do you bring the awareness to the community? Because the community members, we had quite a few, we have quite a few community members in our club, but how do you expand that? How do you get people excited and how do you inspire? And that is really what I wanted to look forward to uh, during your year. Yeah, so we had a couple of um, uh, tenants that we were working with as we got going on this. One was that uh, because I, I came to the gig as a professional speaker and all governors come in with a skill set. If you're a CPA, you're coming in with a, a numeracy. If you're a farmer, you're coming in as somebody who's a nurturing person, you know, and you're used to an agrarian calendar and harvesting and you understand planting and growing. And you can apply that to people, I think, in some aspects. If you are a president of a company, you've got top leadership skills. You, 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 know, you bring that to the gig. I was a professional speaker, still am. And so I brought in this idea that I, I, if I had a, any kind of gift at all as a speaker, that I would wanted to play that uh, card. I wanted, to, I wanted to levy that skill. And I could do it every time I got in front of a microphone. Well, one of the things a district governor has to do is visit all, all the clubs. 
And I mean, in my case, it was 52 clubs. So I started playing with this concept because they, that go public with rotary thing was on my mind. What if all of my club visits were public events and not just club events? Because typically the only people that want to come to the governor's visit are Rotarians from the club. But what if we marketed it as a public event? What could happen? And the first thing, the most important thing is we'd have to deliver to them something that was not just rotary. Otherwise the visitors would go, what'd you bring me here for? So that meant when I did my visit, I had to get, I had to hammer a lot of nails. I had to do the governor thing right. I had to entertain the guests and I had to create an amount of energy in the room that would help people appreciate what just happened. Maybe even appreciate it so much that they would try to replicate it in other ways later on. And so that was the, that was the kindling that started the, 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 the bonfire. We expanded that to the Meet the Governor Night, which was an event that we borrowed from a neighboring district. 6400 has always done a great job with their Meet the Governor Night. I didn't know anything about, because we used to have in our district, a kind of a, no disrespect, a lame, um, I think they called it a district governor installation. And it was a brunch on a Sunday, very poorly attended, not much energy going on. It was just one of those we have to do this. And it was more of a ceremony than a party or what anybody would characterize as fun. But I love the meet the governor night because there could be cocktails. It could be at a fun location. There'd be a dinner. It was more social than the brunch could ever be. And then we found a great location, the Detroit Yacht Club, which was out of the district. It wasn't something, someplace everybody had already been to. So there was this newness, which I think is important when the new guy or gal comes in. It's got to seem like a new thing. This is a key mistake a lot of governors make. They, they get a lot of offers to help. And a lot of the offers come in from the people that did it last year. So your conference chair last year for the district taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I got this down. And if you want, I'll take care of it. And that seems like an easy checkbox. Hey, great. Why don't you do it? So you get the same district um, conference chair. You get the same trainer. Uh, you get four of the same uh, eight AGs. And before you know it, your team, your leadership team is almost the same as it was last year. And guess what that means? Yeah, people have seen it before. Yeah, and you're likely to get the same results. You may even get less than results because they can only pull so many rabbits out of a hat. I remember chatting with an AG one time, it's the AG or a foundation chair. I don't even remember if it was in our district, but we were just chatting. And the person said something about, you know, I'm, it's my third year as foundation. Oh, right. No, they were overtime. It was like my fifth year. This is my fifth year as foundation chair. And you're only supposed to stay for three. <laughs> and she says fifth. And I'm like, whoa. And I said, well, if it's your fifth year, you know, you must be better than ever uh, at being a foundation chair. And there was like this silence, you know, like, like, like that didn't, she didn't understand. And I said, well, if you're, if it's your fifth year and you even got 10% better every year, this would be a really kick-ass year, your fifth year. And I just couldn't get her to agree with me. Well, I thought that was a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is um, if, if you're only going to be governor for one year, you really bang it because you, you only have one year. If you're going to be AG for three years, you're, you're probably not going to do a lot better in your third year than you did in your second year because you, you played all your cards. You, know, you, you either get it or you don't. If you really did well in your second year, you're probably gonna be less than in your third year. If you haven't figured it out by your second year, your third year is gonna be crap. I mean, there's a lot of people that prove this theory to be true, unfortunately. <laughs> so when you come in as governor, everything's bright and shiny and new, and this is your chance to really um, impress people. So that means new team, new events, new packaging, but you only change the packaging on the stuff that's not working. So we changed the packaging on the uh, Meet the Governor night, change the name, move the time of day. Uh, we had uh, music, we had an ice cream. Uh, you go get your own, make your own ice cream thing. That, you know, I'm a music fan and we, we took really good care of the music that night. And it, um, my feelings were hurt that everybody stood in line for ice cream for 45 minutes. <laughs> they didn't give a shit about the music, Collier. They wanted their ice cream. I guess wrong about that, but the good news was we had something that they really raved about, which was the handmade ice cream. Music was playing in the background. 
And I think we did a roast that night. There were no speeches per se. Right. We had a bunch of people roast yours truly, which was another kind of a, I tried not to play into people's expectations too much. I'm a professional speaker. They expected me to regale them with a great motivational talk. Nope. We had people come up and make fun of me. So the twist, right? The surprise. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was how we got the year started. We had really good attendance. I think the best attendance we had ever had for an event like that up until that time. It's nothing to really brag about because the, the other events were kind of lame, but we took a chance. That was, the, that was the part I was most proud of. We took a chance and it set the tone for a bunch of nice things to come. Yeah, one of the things that I remember, again, getting back to the community and not just making it a rotary event is the fact that you had um this camera or the the photo lab or whatever and uh oh, yeah. so i brought my son and, and that was a highlight for him doing the dressing up and you know being fun so those are things that you normally don't find in a meet a governor night yeah we called it a photo booth and right. by the way just to show you how fast trends pass the, the photo booth is kind of passe now the photo booth for those of you that don't know is we just had it wasn't even a booth. It was just a place. It had a backdrop and it had some lighting, I think. And we had some masks and some fake, uh, some props that people could hold in the photo. Right. Um, uh, and then we took the pictures. And, you know, a lot of times when you do that, the fun of it is just posing and, and camping it up. But we made sure those photos saw the light of day, which often doesn't happen in events. We made sure that they were repurposed on uh, in our Facebook groups, our Rotary Facebook groups, so people could continue to have fun. And remember this, this I think this is critical. Every event that you do is to sell tickets to the next event. This year's district conference is to sell tickets to next, this, next year's conference. And that's interesting because you don't really care about selling tickets to the next governor's conference. It's not on your top 10 list things of things to do. But if you do it right, you're doing that next person that huge favor. And it would have been great if the person before you did that favor for you. So there's this kind of um, ongoing succession thing. I think we're going to close this session today talking about, you know, what is the value of the district? The district is a role model. And we set the tone for other things. So most clubs have a Paul Harris night or something. And this year's Paul Harris event for the clubs is to sell next year's Paul Harris event. It's to get people to contribute and get them inspired. If you do that right, you have more participation year over year. It's easier said than done. Um, you had also um, shown interest in talking about how we did our discon. Mm -hmm. um, we went back to the well. So the discon was uh, probably eight months after the Meet the Governor night. And we went back to the same well for the water that tasted good. And one of the things that tasted good was going outside the district uh, because we wanted to create a thing. And so our district happens to be, as you know, in Southeastern Michigan and part of Canada, we went to the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, four hours north, way out of district. It's not an easy place to get to. We also had noticed that in the past few years, people were cherry picking our own discount. They were coming to lunch if it was convenient or they were coming just to the uh, dinner on one of the nights. Mm. But if you go to Mackinac Island, man, from Detroit, we got you for the weekend. And I wanted everybody for the weekend. None of this drive-by stuff. Right. Well, sounds good. How easy is it to pull off? Well, you now you have to put all this value proposition into the, into the weekend. So the Grand Hotel is a world-class tourist destination. And we started telling everybody it was open to the public. Our district, Rotary District Conference, anybody could come. And this blew the tops of people's heads off because why would anybody want to go to a Rotary conference that wasn't a Rotarian? Well, we started with other people that we knew in Rotary because I happened to get out on the speaking circuit um, with Rotary. I have Rotary friends all over the world. And a lot of them were tracking my upward mobility and said, I want to come to your district conference. And I, I just never forgot that. What a nice thing for them to say we better have it in a nice place. And I just kept that swimming in my head. And then it became time to choose the place. And it occurred to me, these people that have been saying this to me all these, all these years, you know, I want to come to your district conference. Some of them were from other states. Some of them from, were from countries other than the United States and Canada. 
And so we ended up having people from Great Britain attend the conference. We ended up having Rotarians from other districts attend the conference, other zones. And this had never been done before. And we increased attendance at our district conference 30% over the year prior. Now, people asked me after the fact, what, what, it, what, can you, what do you attribute it to? Well, it was, it's not one thing, it was everything. It was the Grand Hotel. It was, um, and the Grand Hotel, for those of you that don't know, is on Mackinac Island where there are no automobiles. It's just horses and bicycles. It's the most unique location. People do travel from all over the world to get there. We also brought in my speaker buddies. We didn't have a bunch of people talking about, and no disrespect again, all the rotary stuff, all the rotary stuff that we hear about endlessly, right? I mean, we've made a career and, and um, a long project out of eradicating polio. But you can only trot out the iron lung so many times before people start yawning a little bit. You know, we've seen this before. And so I brought in a memory expert and we brought in a, um, a rap group. I think they were called, uh, what did they? They had a name for themselves. I can't think of it right now, but it was the most unusual act. It was inspirational. It, was, it would fire you up. It was rhythmic. It was fun. And uh, it was nothing that anybody had ever seen. And when we promoted the event, we would promote just that act in a text. We wouldn't say register for the district conference because the, we have too many events in Rotary Collier where, um, where you have to come, but you may not necessarily wanna come. And we want this to be an event you want to come to. It's a different, it comes in a different part of the brain. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. And then the food, the buffet at uh, Grand, the Grand Hotel is like a quarter of a mile long. It's unbelievable when you see it the first time. And we kept talking about it like that. Um, a, a great writing coach once told me that you, you write in all five senses. So I think when you're selling an event, you sell the visual. So you saw pictures of the Grand Hotel, um, the taste, right? So we tell you what the buffet tastes like, the smells, the sounds, the, the horses clopping. We were selling all of that all the way. And I sell in, um, even with my own business, when I do consulting or speaking events, we sell in 100 day calendar uh, production. So three months out, people start getting saved the date. And we think we did it a lot longer than that with the district conference because it was an annual event. I mean, we sold, just to tell you how extreme we took it, we were the first year to do electronic, like you could pay with your credit card at the conference before. And we had collected, I don't know, $4,000 or something at the previous year's conference that we used for seed money and deposit. We not only had psychological buy-in from all those people, we had financial commitment. And it was the first time it was ever done because we were zipping their credit card at the conference. And it wasn't easy to figure out back then. It's a lot easier now with Square and everything. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, so that's uh, those are the couple of, uh, strategies that we use to get 30% uh, more people to come to the discon. Um, did you say you were celebrating the, the Ann Arbor Centennial that year? We were, that's right. So we had a lot going that, on. Same year that we celebrated the Foundation Centennial. I think uh, that was in Atlanta. No, that was, the, that was the uh, Rotary International Convention was in Atlanta. Right. But the reason I know that we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Rotary Foundation that year was because I saw that as an opportunity to increase giving during the 16, 17 year when I was governor. And so we held a million dollar dinner. And why did we do that? that? Because three years prior, uh, I got picked up at the airport for a speaking gig for Rotary. And they're picking up another guy at the same time who I had never met. And the reason this guy was coming to talk is because he was an expert at staging million dollar dinners. And he took us all to lunch. And at lunch, I'm asking this guy a million questions. And that became the seed that we planted uh, for the million dollar dinner in 2017. And I think that coordinated with the World Peace Conference that your club, that Ashish from your club coordinated, and it was right. all done in Ann Arbor. So we did these things I ask governors around this time of the year, the end of December, what is your legacy going to be? And a lot of them wave me off and they go, I don't need a legacy. I'm just serving, 
you know, service above self. I don't care about my legacy. I'm like, I think that's a mistake because when you're governor, people will remember you for something. Right. Please tell me they remember you for something good. <laughs> and so I had a chance to be remembered for increasing district conference attendance 30%, me and my team. I had a chance to be remembered for staging our one and only million dollar hit, uh, dinner that we've ever had. They're talking now about doing another one. Maybe if we could do it in your year, I'd help you with it. Uh, first year that we ever did a meet the governor night in our district and stage it like a Hollywood event. First year we went public with Rotary and, and uh, back to the, the club visits that I did, we had the media showing up, the newspaper coming out to cover the event. Because if we can get a hundred people to gather in a small town on any given day where, where there's a Rotary Club, that's the biggest thing happening in that town that day. And the local right. paper comes out to talk to whoever's involved. And so they wanted to interview the guest speaker, me, happened to be the incoming governor or the governor from Rotary. And I you know, give a big commercial for Rotary <clears throat> and everybody wins. What's that fourth thing in the four-way test, beneficial to all concerned? It's pretty cool. It was a great uh, year, 2016, 2017. Well, I appreciate that. And we've had other, we've had great years of, uh, for other reasons. Um, but, you know, because I travel around so much on the Rotary speaking circuit, I get exposed to all these good ideas, right? And then I'm able to bring them back to our district. And I think that's important. In the same way that the average Rotarian needs to do club visits to truly appreciate what, what's going on in their own club. I was learning to really appreciate what was happening in 6380 and what wasn't happening in 6380 by going out to speak at these other places. And I was noting what not to do and what to do. And it was a fantastic education. The education continues. Uh, I'll be speaking at Great Lakes Rotary Pets in March. Um, a third a component of this um, go public thing is this idea of the, the district trainer, which is a key position in the district. Um, again, no disrespect, but a lot of rotary training is less than, it's average at best. Um, I've always thought that we should have people standing in line to be president of clubs. And we know that's not the case because a lot of people say they're being pressed into service for the second or third time in the club and nobody wants to be president and it's drudgery and you got to twist arms to get it to happen. Does this sound familiar to you? I, I, that's <laughs> the we have a large enough club, but I know in smaller clubs, it does typically happen. Yeah, tell everybody how many are in your club. Well, we have uh, about 250. Yeah, it's a huge club. It's one of the, it's what they call, uh, it's large club status. I think that's what they're actually called, yeah? Right, large club, right. Yeah. So one of the top, uh, what, what are you like? I, I heard the number one time, was it 14 at one time? Well, we're the number one, the largest club in the state of Michigan. And I think around the world, we're in the, uh, within the top 35 or something like that. 35, okay. Yeah. But imagine these clubs that have, you know, 15, 20 people, sometimes 10, uh, they just rotate the presidents. Some clubs have taken to having the same president two or three years in a row because it's easier not to shift everybody out. Um, I've always thought that if rotary training was so special that people would join rotary and want to become president of the club just to get that training. That's how good that training is. I, I thought that would be a fantastic goal but they don't, they don't want to become president so they can go to pets and get, get all that world-class training. It's not what we're known for. We could be, but it, that's not what we're known for. And so um, this training thing is, is interesting because even Rotary Leadership Institute, which is like the gold standard for training in Rotary, I, I, th I think it could be so much more. This is just my opinion now. I'm not speaking for anybody but myself but it's called Rotary Leadership Training. I thought, well, because the first time I went to it, I'm like, great, I'm going to learn about budgets and I'm going to learn how to even be better speaker because of presentation skills. I'm going to learn how to plan a district conference and, and events. I'm going to learn about um, uh, marketing and uh, copywriting and, um, and motivating people and all these things. No, it's mostly about Rotary. 
it's mostly rotary history and how rotary works. And it's very, very insular. And I think the best trainers are the ones that bring maybe a business textbook or a business book to the training, or they, they're quoting outside sources or they're, um, and then again, this is just me talking or, or the trainer is really good at entertaining as well as teaching. So you're getting that both pieces because a lot of the training is reviewed as dry. Actually, we have a bigger problem than that. When you ask most people how the training was, they're good people and they don't want to say anything bad. So guess what they say? It's great. It was and great. So that, that's the, yeah. yeah. And then they show that to the trainer and that validates that they can do the exact same thing next year. You know, I'm being a little dramatic here. They always say something, but oftentimes the, 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 the comment is, well, the training was great, but the lunch on Saturday wasn't very good. And then we go to focus on the lunch. <laughs> so it's like getting distracted by a squirrel outside, you know, not focused on the right thing. Right. And this all comes down to, and this will be our final point for this, unless, and I'll answer any questions you have, is that um, uh, this is really about leadership succession. You know, that, that everybody works with a partner or a stunt double or a second in command. And that second in command is getting training and becoming 10% better than the person before them, right? And we, we just keep increasing the efficacy and the uh, value of our organization. And we know that's not happening, happening as well as it could. What other questions do you have or thoughts as, you, as you're a year well, and a half out? You first, when you become uh, the district governor, in that process, you realize, well, oh my gosh, this is a huge undaunting task. So what's important is putting together a team. And I'm just curious how you put your team together, what you looked for and how you developed that. Yeah, um, I look for three things. I look for people who are resourceful, coachable, and uh, good communicators. And if you don't have those three things, I, I might still want to work with you, but other people that have those three things are going to, are going to be moving up first. Um, I didn't want you in the position necessarily because you were there before or that you've been there a long time. In fact, sometimes that was a reason to get somebody new, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And I never did it with malice. I never did it uh, with my own personal agenda. I always did it in the best interest, long-term interest, sometimes short-term interest of the district. A uh, quick example, uh, AGs, assistant governors in our part of the Rotary world, as you know, are asked to serve three-year terms. And sometimes those AGs get appointed, uh, they either, either the person appointing them doesn't know them very well, or the AG is not really ready for the job, but they take it anyway because they think it's an honor and they can kind of cakewalk it. And so I had inherited some AGs, not only from the governor before me, but probably the governor even before that. And I was asking around, you know, and you get feedback, not just from the AGs, you get feedback from the clubs. Like I haven't seen my AG in two years. And I'm taking notes, right? Not because I need to play gotcha, but I want the best. Jim Collins said in the book, Good to Great, there's that outside reference I just told you about. He says, you got to get the right people on the bus and you got to get the right people in uh, people in the right seats on that bus. And uh, so the AGs were on the right bus. They weren't in the right seat. They weren't good AGs. They weren't even showing up to their clubs, which is like the minimum standard for getting any kind of a approval rating from anybody. <laughs> yeah. And so now I'm in a spot, right? I'm either going to inherit this impotent AG. Let's just use one. I, there were a lot of uh, people that weren't doing a good job on the leadership team. And I could either weather the storm and I could be a good guy and not, not offend anybody. And I could just go along to get along and have an average year, or I could do what was best for everybody and somehow find a way to fill that spot with somebody that could maybe do a better job. And so I had a few heart to hearts with people and I would call an AG, for example. And I said, uh, how, how's it going? <laughs> pretty much knowing the answer to the question, but I, I want to hear what they say. And there's, a, there's an old uh, interview technique called ask why five times, because 
Sometimes people need to hear the same question five different ways before you get to the closer version of the truth. So the first answer was everything's going great. And the second question was something like, um, how is it going with your AG responsibilities? Oh, great again, great. Uh, so you're getting out to visit the clubs then? Oh yeah. Well, fourth question, how many times uh, a quarter are you visiting with your clubs? And then, you know, the answer is, it's quiet. <laughs> and they're trying to figure out how to answer me without embarrassing themselves. Mind you, I already know the answer. And here's what I found out, that a lot of them didn't want to be AG anymore. I mean, do you believe what people say or what they do? Right. And so very quickly in the conversation, I would say, look, I appreciate you being straight up with me. And I understand that this isn't working for you. You've got some challenges at work that keep you from showing up to Rotary Club meetings as often as you'd like to. I didn't say as often as you should. I didn't say as often as you promised. I said as often as you would like to. And maybe it's time for had to, you know, to have somebody else serve in the role so that they can at least show up to the clubs and 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 uh, do the AG thing. And with, I'll say with 50% of the people I talked to, really, you would do that for me? Like they were relieved because they knew they weren't doing a good job. And I didn't do this to be a bad cop. I didn't do it to be any kind of cop. I, I did it because I wanted to have a team that functioned so that I could leave the district better than I found it. And I, there was no way I could do that if I left everybody in that bus seat. I probably did not make a lot of friends in that way. You know, there were some people that were thought maybe I was after their job or something. It couldn't be further from the truth. And it breaks my heart that, that some of those people thought that about me, but I just thought it was the right thing to do at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, and I tried to do it with grace and diplomacy and straight up with everybody. I didn't do anything behind anybody's back, you know. But I think if you, just, if you just take whatever they give you and you don't make it your own, you're, you're doomed to an average year. We, we wanted you to be governor. The committee, the nominating committee, selected you as governor because they want you to be Collier Smith. They want you to bring all that you can to the position. They don't want you to just, you know, float like a stick down the river. They wanted a governor with a rudder and a motor and an engine and a, and a compass. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, this has been very helpful. And um, I just want to make sure resourceful, coachable. What was the third one? You. Well, um, I said communication earlier, but how about decisive? It's even more pointed, decisive. Make up your mind. You're either yeah. doing something, you're not doing it. You know, this ambivalence, I'm getting around to it. Uh, you know, the assignment was due a week ago Friday. You know, I'm almost finished with it. That's not helpful to me. Right. You know, we have deadlines for a reason. It sounds like I'm a hard ass, but I'm really not. I'm just like, just do what you say you were going to do. You know? And then you'll hear this a lot as governor, you know, well, it's just a volunteer organization. You know, I don't even have to do this. I'm like, yeah, but you said you were going to do it. What does that count for anything? And I didn't, that wasn't the first time they heard that from me. I opened the year, like we had a meeting with all the AGs and uh, it was an overnight and uh, treated them to a dinner and, you know, get to know kind of a thing. We played some pool and stuff, had some fun. And that's when they first started you know, getting to know me and my uh, philosophy a little bit. You know, I, I'm glad you're aboard. I'm going to expect you to do some stuff. Great. Be assigned a lead AG for the first time ever. You may be hearing that term. I don't know how effective it is in 6380 right now, or if they're still doing it. They are. But one of the things, the first year was the 1617. Because what happened, we found out was that the, a lot of times the AGs were like this mysterious group of people and nobody really knew who was in charge or what was going on or who was, who was doing a good job as AG, right? And I wanted somebody to own it. It was Nick Castile that year, I think. I asked him to be, I think, I, I'm not quite sure about that, but I think it was, it might've been Aaliyah McDonald, forgive me, I can't remember. 
but I wanted somebody to be the face of the AGs because I knew that if we could spotlight somebody who was really kicking it, that they would not only inspire the team that year, but they would have these upwardly mobile club presidents wanting to be AG so they could be like Aaliyah or be like Nick. And then of course, if your governor does a good job several years later, um, governors wanna be like Michael back in the day. And, and Brenda Tipton is our great district governor this year. Brenda is inspiring people. I just told her the other day, you're inspiring people and you don't even know it yet. But in two years, someone will say, I put my hat in to be district governor because of you, Brenda. And it's such a good feeling. Yeah, she's wonderful to work with. Yeah. And, and it, you know, you don't want it to go the other way where a bunch of people are unimpressed with governor after governor and decide not to, not to try for the top spot because it seemed like such a flaccid, unrewarding position, you know? Right. You don't want that kind of a reputation. But I'm proud of you and you're, you're at, certainly asking good questions and the, you initiated this call today. I really appreciate that. And, and, and thank you for letting us record it. Hopefully it helps other incoming leaders understand the lay of the land and some of the things that are necessary uh, to improve our great organization. Rotary is the greatest service organization in the world. And we can only maintain that, that birth by keeping our standards high. Anything else I can help you with today? I think um, this covers quite a, a lot of ground. And I appreciate your time. Yeah, my pleasure. This is uh, Rotary District 6380, everybody. We are in zone 28. So if you want to know more about uh, Collier's activities, and I'm public image chair for zone 28 right now here in uh, 2021. Uh, you can check us out on the Zone 28 and 32 Facebook group, also the District 6380 Facebook group. Collier, I look forward to working with you, man, and thank you very much for all you're about to do. Thank you, and I appreciate your time. Thanks, Michael.